Hello ladies and gentlemen of the internet. After about four to five months, the skull is back. I didn't forget about it after all. I promised this skull as a giveaway once my Patreon reaches 25 patrons, so I have to finish it because we're getting closer and closer. If you would like to get your hands on this skull and learn sculpture from me at the same time, check out my Patreon page. There is a link in the description below. We currently have 17 patrons, and once we reach 25 patrons, every $25 and over patron will receive one of these skulls. This can be used as a reference, or you can display it as a strange object in your bathroom or bedroom, for example. The skull will also be for sale on my web store once I get that up and running at some undisclosed time in the future. You can also click the link to Skillshare down below in the description. This will let you try two months of Skillshare for free and it supports my channel. It's a win-win situation for the both of us. Okay, so this video is going to be about finishing this sculpture. It had been sitting under the plastic bag for months and had dried out quite a bit and it was full of mold. So I started out by cleaning off the mold and covering the sculpture for a few days with a moist rag to get some of the moisture back into the clay. This is a great trick if you have some area that dries out really fast while sculpting as well. Cover it with a wet rag, cotton works well and the clay will moisten up again. Don't leave the rag for too long though, as it will start to rot, and eventually it gets stuck to your clay. And this can turn into a bit of a mess, as I've experienced, and it's hard to clean off rotten pieces of thread from a cotton t-shirt without damaging the surface of your clay. And sometimes you can get an imprint of the, of the fabric in your clay, which is a big problem. In addition to mold, the sculpture had cracked in a few areas. Now, there are ways to deal with cracks that work well and some that don't work so well. We'll cover the ones that work well. You don't want to instantly spray the sculpture once you see a crack. If water works its way into the crack, it can grow the crack wider and loosen your sculpture from the armature at the same time, which of course would be a disaster. Instead, you push clay into the crack, making sure that you fill whatever void exists behind the crack, beneath the crack. Essentially filling empty space where water can, can gather up and erode the inside of your sculpture. And you know, what eventually will happen is that you will damage the surface doing this, but you'll, you'll get a fixed crack and the surface can easily be fixed once the crack is filled. You want to go, you want to get to the crack as soon as possible, as soon as you spot them. If you leave them for too long, water will continue to go into them and it will just grow the crack and the void beneath the crack, which will leave your sculpture very vulnerable. The tools I use is more or less the same tools I use for everything. I have a whole video on tools that you can check out. For the most part, Finishing this skull is going to be done using a Kemper loop tool and some Sculpture House rake tools. The Sculpture House rake tools have teeth on one side of the wire and on the other side it's smooth. So I use the smooth side while cleaning up the surface. But the Kemper tool is the king of this sort of work. As long as you keep the wire loop clean and avoid getting it gummed up with clay, it creates a really nice clean surface. One thing you'll find is that if you clean the tool regularly, the clay won't dry on the loop. And if you let the clay dry on the loop, on the metal loop, uh, it'll make scratch marks in the surface. It can also scratch the metal loop eventually, which is something I don't worry too much about, but if you're really anal about keeping a clean surface, this is something to keep in mind, because if you have a scratch tool, you'll introduce scratch marks into your clay as well. Personally, as you maybe know, I'm not super into cleaning and smoothing the surface to an excessive degree. I prefer a surface that's a little rougher. I guess I could use the excuse that, in this case at least, the rougher surface on the skull speaks of the age of the skull, but 
to be honest, in reality, it's a little bit of laziness as well. I'm also just not very interested in spending hours upon hours cleaning up the surface. And a lot of the cleaning can be done with sanding, at least in some areas, once the skull is in a different material. And I've always enjoyed some texture on my sculptures. After all, it's a sculpture of a skull, so leaving a little bit of my personal touch is not something that bothers me one bit. So a couple of words on accuracy. Once I started this sculpture, I had not sculpted in almost six months. And so this was, for me, a nice way to get back into the sculpting portion of the channel and, and practice my accuracy a little bit. I really ended up not spending enough time on this to make it completely accurate, but it's pretty close. Especially around the face area and the overall contours, they're, they're pretty close. But the detail on the back of the head, it's not entirely after my plaster model. It's, it's close enough, but... I added some of my own sensibilities to the sculpt to a certain degree, overemphasizing certain forms to create what is hopefully an exciting end product. The plan originally was to spend a lot of time to get this super accurate, but frankly I ran out of interest and, and patience, and I started sculpting the King of the Rusted Crown, and I just ended up spending all my time doing that instead. While sculpting skulls is a great exercise, it's not something that I, it's not what I kind of wanted to do, aspired to do once I graduated from the Florence Academy of Art. And so my normally immense patience ran out and I went for the finish before everything was as accurate as it could be and perhaps as it should be. Having said this, however, I do think this skull can be used very effectively by novice sculptors to, to practice the sculpting of the skull. Getting hold of a decent plaster cast seems to be way harder than it should be. Either they are complete trash or they are immensely expensive and accurate reproductions. And I think this could be a good alternative for some of you looking for a skull to use as a model. If you are one of my first 25 patrons you can get this skull and again there's a link in the description below. Or you can wait until I grow up and make a web store, which probably might never happen, but maybe one day. If I remember correctly, the skull, the plaster skull that this sculpture is sculpted after is from a female Asian, though I can't remember 100%, and, but this is, I think that's what it is. You can apparently tell um, that it is a female Asian because of the relationship between the jaw and the brow. Again, I, I think I'm right here and I could very well be wrong, so if I'm wrong and you know I'm wrong, please leave a comment below and let me know. Maybe you have some, some insight into the matter that I lack for some reason. It's important to remember that once you have established your sculpture and attack it with a loop tool or a rake, that you have to be careful so you don't rake or loop away all the high points you've spent time establishing. Now this is a real danger and it, and it tends to happen a lot. People establish what is a fairly accurate and good sculpture and then they rake it all away into nothing, thinking that they are unifying the forms and cleaning up the surface, when what they're actually doing is just making a flat sculpture. Taking away all the volume that you've spent time building up. It doesn't make any sense. So when I do use my loops and rakes, I do so with a lot of caution and as you can see, I use it together with my wood tools as well to add clay. And I also use a very light touch while using the loop tool, so I'm barely letting it scrape the surface and I'm not taking any large amounts of clay off. My fingers are also a very useful tool. And just as the loop tool, keeping your fingers clean and not full of dry clay is going to help you out here a lot. I try to have a rag around so I can clean my tools and my hands of dried out clay. Actually, trying to work as clean as possible is a good habit to get into in general. And I'm actually planning a video on working clean and the dangers of not working clean. Because I think it's an important thing that perhaps people don't know too much about. They don't know the health hazard that water-based clay, water clay can pose. 
and if you want to know about that do a quick google search on clay and you'll be really surprised and by how bad clay dust can be for you it will essentially be a good opportunity for me to clean my studio and film it and make a video about it telling you to clean your studio around the teeth I'm trying to avoid getting things too sharp I don't want the teeth to stand out too much it's an interesting conversation to have I think about how to balance sculpting reality and sculpting in a more abstract visual way and this is probably not the time to have it I think but because it deserves a whole video of its own but essentially I'm abstracting the teeth a little bit here going for a more visual approach which ends up leaving me with a much softer edge between the teeth and the jaws and the teeth themselves I think this way of thinking about sculpture lends itself very well to most 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 subjects it's about the whole, not about a single part or element. And so playing with and deciding what edge to keep sharp and what edge to keep soft is a very interesting way of sculpting and can play a part in directing the eyes of the audience in the way that you prefer. Of course, it's not super applicable to a simple sculpture of a skull, but I think it's an important concept that you can perhaps take with you and, and try in more interesting and complex projects. Okay, so here I am actually trying something new. It's not entirely new. I've seen people do this before. And it's applying baby powder or talcum powder to your sculpture. And it's essentially a way of smoothing out the surface somewhat. It's a lot less abrasive than water. And it dries out, on, it dries out the surface a little bit. So you can use your finger to buff out some areas very, very easily after you applied it. I don't think it's something that I will do a lot on other sculptures, but these sorts of things are, are sometimes worth the attempt, if nothing else. You can, of course, use water and a brush as well, though I, I personally don't recommend that. And I know people also use isopropyl alcohol because it is less abrasive than water. Personally, I just prefer to finish my work with tools the old school way, but without any shortcuts but as I've said I was pretty ready to get this thing done at this point and so I tried the baby powder and of course you need to spray it off uh, with water at the end okay so that's it for the skull if you want to learn how to sculpt or would like to support my next project or get your hands on this little skull, check out the link to my Patreon page in the description below. I hope you enjoy this video series, subscribe to follow the next project that will come in the near future and please share this video with your friends. Thank you for watching and I hope to see you in the next one.